get right into the word. Is that me? Okay, am I on? There we go. Okay, good morning. Let's go ahead and stand if you would, please. Open your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of First Thessalonians, and we'll pray, and then we'll get right into the Word. Lord, we come before you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be present. We ask your Spirit to come and speak that you'd anoint your word and that you'd give us a study that's simple and powerful. And the Lord rebuke you, Satan. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we come to the fifth chapter this morning of the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul has been in chapter 4 addressing the questions that this church had regarding those believers that had died. Paul was concerned, man, is that me? He was pretty concerned about the state of the church since he had left there. He was only there for three weeks. I'm not going to be able to move, am I? Okay, I'll just stay right here and try try not to turn my head or anything. (laughs) Do you have another one of these things back there? Okay, should I keep talking till you get here or should I just... Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm, I'm good. I can, I can move, so. All right, well, anyway, Paul had only spent three weeks. This, this microphone might be a lot louder than that one. It is, isn't it? Can you turn it down a little bit in case I get yelling here or something? Okay. Paul had only been in Thessalonica for three weeks when he started the church. That's all he was there, and he got run out of town. And uh, there were a lot of things that he taught them in that three weeks. I think it's very important today that we take note of the things that having only three weeks, only three Sabbaths, and you know, probably only saw some of those people three times, because some people only come on Sunday, right? (laughs) Well, and, you know, maybe they don't watch on Wednesday, you know, they weren't watching the internet feed or something, I don't know, but... He didn't have a lot of time with them. And it's pretty interesting when you think about the things that he taught them. It might not be the things that you would think you ought to teach if you only had three weeks, three Sabbaths. But then again, after we look at what he taught them and why, I think it will become evident that these are the things that need to be taught. And a lot of times, well, today in the church, they're not being taught. And I read an interesting article, and I don't want to get off base, but it was talking about the decline of the evangelical church. This this really interested me. It talked about how the megachurch phase of Christianity has kind of run its course. Uh, Megachurches, especially since COVID, their numbers are declining rapidly. And the evangelical church, their numbers are declining rapidly. 
But this a particular uh, person, it wasn't like a scientific study, but he had taken note that those churches that are teaching the end times, the evangelical churches that are not afraid to teach Bible prophecy, those churches are growing. And so that's what Paul taught the Thessalonians in the three weeks. He taught them about the end times. He taught them about, he taught them a lot of other things too, but he taught them about the return of Jesus Christ. Now, he had, uh, he's writing this letter back to them because of some of the things that he found out that they didn't understand when he was there. And one of those things was uh, the church knew that Jesus was going to return for the church, and they were looking at him, for him to return at any moment, and that was good. But when some of the people began to die since Paul had left, they became concerned. They didn't know what was going to happen to those people because they hadn't specifically talked about that. And so Paul, part of the reason he wrote back to them was to assure them that those believers that had died in Jesus uh, the Lord, when he returned from the church, he would bring those with him. They'd come back with him, those people that had died in Christ. And then he said, we, isn't that interesting? Almost 2,000 years ago, writing to this church, Paul said, we which are alive and remain when the Lord comes. That's, that's his inference. He didn't say those people in the way future. He was looking for the Lord to come. At any moment, he said, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then if you look at the last verse of chapter four, he said, wherefore, that means based on this information, comfort one another. There's two parts to this. It's interesting. Comfort one another with these words. Comfort. That's the word parakaleo in the Greek. It means to, to come alongside. It's, it's often the word used as a reference for the Holy Spirit. He's saying, you know, there is this comforting aspect that the Holy Spirit possesses that the church can move in. We can come alongside one another, and we're supposed to do that. Uh, and, and it means to come alongside and to encourage we live in a discouraging world. Do you understand that? <laughs> Things are not getting better. People are, are generally getting more and more discouraged. Not just old people, not just middle-aged people. It's like I'm old, I'm past middle age, I think. And people call me sir, and I'm like, what? That? What are you talking? That's my dad, you know. And then I look in the mirror, and oh, good, yeah, okay. But I think I'm past middle age. And so you can understand why old people are discouraged. You, get, you know, you can't do the things you used to do. Life maybe didn't turn out like you thought it would. And even to some degree, middle-aged people, but young people. The studies show today that young people in this country are generally very discouraged. Very discouraged. And the, the, the medical industry, they're, they're trying hard to... to, to to uh, deal with this, but they're having trouble dealing with it. Uh, they, they, I could get off on, I don't want to do that. But the problem is they're trying to deal with an emotion, the spiritual problem. They're trying to treat it in a, a physical or emotional way. And it, it's not very effective. And, and so we live in a discouraging world. You maybe came here today you might be discouraged. You know, the world calls it depression, and they treat it as such. And, and there's an element of that that we understand. It means to be pressed down. But the Bible doesn't really use the word pressed down. One time Paul said, I was not depressed, but pressed down beyond measure. You know what word the Bible uses, which I think describes what's taking place better? It uses the word discouraged. People are losing the courage to go on living. That's what it is. Old people, middle-aged people, and young people. Why are they losing courage? There's no hope. There's, there's no hope for the future. 
in this world. You see, you see what's going on in Russia? Don't read the news because it makes you mad, you know, but that does. But you remember the days of the Cold War? I grew up in that where we were like worried that Russia was going to bomb us, you know. And then, 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 that, and then that was de-escalated and, and things became better. It's coming back again. Russia just came out with a new bomb, a nuclear warhead this week. And they said this, everybody better be, they better be worried about us now. And, you know, you look at that and you go, what, what hope is there, is, is there in that? And, and, you know, nuclear war, what hope is there in that? Who, who wins in nuclear war? And it's not that I'm against defending ourselves. I'm not saying that in any way. I believe in that strongly. But when you look at the escalation of society today and the direction that we're headed, we're just going to destroy each other. You know, the one thing about this country and, and their, uh, that has been the heart of our military, it's been to preserve what's good and righteous and, and to fight against that which is not good and righteous. But the rest of the world, is a lot of it's not like that. They just want to destroy everybody else and they want to be king. And you look at it and there's a, there's a lot of hopelessness in society. I don't know if there's more hopelessness today than there was in Paul's day, but there's a lot of discouraged people today. And Paul here gives the remedy for discouragement. It's the comfort of the church. That's where the hope is found in this world. We're to come alongside one another. We're to be comforting one another. May the Lord give that gift of encouragement to this body today so that if there's those that come in that are discouraged, and you know what happens when that happens to you, you don't tell anybody, and you can't always tell by looking. You can't tell always by some people. You can. They you don't have to. You, you know they're easy to read. Some people aren't. Most of the time, you don't know. But see, God gives the gift of encouragement the gift of exhortation through the Holy Spirit, so you can supernaturally know. You just know you need to go encourage that person. And you want to pay attention to that. There may be somebody here today that you need to encourage. So Paul said, comfort one another. And notice how, with these words. What words? The Word of God. That's where we find comfort. That's where we find hope in this day and age. If you are looking to the world for your source of hope, you are going to be discouraged. Maybe that's why you're discouraged. Because you're looking to the world. Get your eyes off the world. Colossians 3.2 says, set your affection on things above. Set your mind on things above. Not on the things of this earth. The things of this earth, as we're going to see, become real evident today if you don't understand why things are becoming like they are. They're becoming like they are because we're heading towards the end. The Bible clearly said these things would take place. The Thessalonians knew it, but most of the church doesn't even know it today because we quit teaching the Word, and the world sure doesn't know it. And so there's a lot of discouraged people. We don't need to be discouraged. We can find hope in the midst of this chaos and mayhem, and that hope comes in the person of Jesus Christ through the Word of God. He is the Word of God. John uh the book of John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's chapter 1 of the book of John. And verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that? That's Jesus. He's the Word, the living Word. This book, the Bible, it's all about Jesus. Even the Old Testament, it's all about Him. And that's where we find comfort. So back to chapter 1 now of 1 Thessalonians 5. So he told them about the rapture. He said, hey, those people that died, they, didn't, they weren't alive for the, the, the rapture of the church. Don't worry about them. The Lord's going to bring them back when he comes. He's coming back. He's still coming. And, and those that are alive and remain, they'll be caught up. Everybody will be united in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. You know, that's your comfort. Jesus is coming. 
You need to look for that and hope in that because uh, this world doesn't give you much hope. But the Lord's going to take you out of this world. This world is not our home. Understand that? It's not our home. We're just passing through. This life, the Bible says, is but the blink of an eye. And it's not where God wants us to be forever since sin came. And so he prepared another place for us, and we'll talk about that. And then verse 5, verse 1, excuse me, of chapter 5, Paul says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you, for yourselves, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, Paul begins chapter 5 with the word but, not and, but the conjunction but, which suggests he is about to bring some contrasting information. The thing that he is going to talk about now in chapter 5 is to some degree at least different than that thing he was talking about in chapter 4. He had been writing specifically about the rapture of the church and the comfort that that brings. Now he's going to begin to write about something else. And verse 2 tells us what that something else is. It's the day of the Lord. Now, as we go on here in chapter 5, there are three phrases that we need to understand, at least to some degree. And listen, if you've never heard this before, it can be very confusing. The timing and you don't understand. Don't get discouraged because you have to hear it for the first time. And when you hear it for the first time, you do not understand it like you will when you hear it for the 10th time. Some of you are hearing it for the 20th time and you know it better than me. Praise the Lord. But some of you might not know. And so if this doesn't make perfect sense to you. If you don't know it perfectly, don't get discouraged. Don't let the devil beat you up. You have to start somewhere. Hey, it's a good place to start right here, right now. Amen? Because G, uh, Hosea 4.6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So let's don't be destroyed. Open your heart and let the Spirit teach you. So there are three phrases that we need to understand. The first phrase is the rapture of the church. Now, we talked about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 last week. So if you don't understand that, get last week's teaching. That's when Jesus returns, not to the earth, but in the air. He comes back in the clouds, and he takes the church, not a building with the steeple on it, but the, those that have given their lives to Jesus Christ, the true believers, all of them that are alive, he takes the church up into the clouds to meet him and the rest of the believers that have died so they can meet the Lord together in the air and forever be with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church. The second thing phrase that we need to understand is the second coming of Christ. Now that's different than the rapture of the church. It takes place after the rapture. Now, here's something that's really important for us to understand as we go through this this morning. After the rapture of the church, the church, the believers, they're gone. Why is that important to understand? Because we're going to talk about some really, really difficult things today that are going to take place. Keep in mind, though, that if you know Jesus Christ, you won't be here for this. That's our blessed hope. That's why we have hope. This world's falling apart. Why? Because the end is coming. It's the birth pangs. And we, we understand that. The world doesn't understand that, but we do. We need to tell them so they're not caught off guard. Because many people are going to be, we'll talk about that. So the second coming of Christ, it takes place after the rapture. The church is gone. It's at the end of the seven years of great tribulation. You know, you've heard that phrase, the great tribulation. There's one thing I remember from Sunday school growing up when I was a kid. It was the great tribulation, man. I was terrified of that. And that's not a bad thing. That's a healthy fear of God. Well, the second coming of Christ takes place after that seven years of great 
tribulation. At the second coming, Jesus comes back to the earth with the church. We'll be coming with him. It's Revelation 19. And he's coming back to judge an unbelieving world. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The third phrase that you need to understand and what Paul is going to specifically talk about here in the first part of 1 Thessalonians is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, the phrase... The day of the Lord does not refer to a literal 24-hour period of time, but rather a period of time, a period of time that is yet to come. And in the day of the Lord, God will pour out his wrath upon the unbelieving world. This world has never seen yet the wrath of God. God brings correction upon the world today. The Chinese, I love it, they have a phrase for that. They call it small judgment. And you may have experienced that. He chastises every believer. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. And, and you know that. God doesn't just let you go your own way. You know, He'll put roadblocks in your way and things won't go good because you are not serving the Lord. And that small judgment comes. And, and he, deals, he, he deals in small judgment with the unbelievers in the world in many different ways. They don't have his blessing and, and he stands against them. He opposes them. He loves them. He's, he's wanting them to come to Christ. But he doesn't just put his blessing upon the unbelieving world world. But that's not his wrath. This world has never seen the wrath of God. And, and, and it's something, and you read the book of Revelations, that God is not looking forward to doing. And it's something that no individual has to experience because God made a way out of that through Jesus Christ. But many, the Bible is clear, many people will reject Jesus and they will experience the wrath of God. And there is a coming day when God will begin to wrap this whole creation up and he will pour his wrath out and his judgment upon this world. He will at that time work again supernaturally among the nation of Israel. God is not really working among the nation of Israel, not in a great way right now. And he's beginning to. There are stirrings over there. But during the tribulation period, we know that in Zechariah 12, it says that they're going to realize in a great way that they miss the Messiah. The Jews hate Jesus. They hate anything to do with him. They don't even want to hear his name. But... There is a coming day during the tribulation where the Lord will begin to work among them again. Zechariah 12 says they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. They'll go, man, we missed him. We missed him. And there's going to be great revival among the nation of Israel and the Jewish people during the great tribulation. So that will take place. But at that time... God will make it clear that he is the one and only sovereign God of the universe. This day of the Lord, it's also referred to as Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 37, the great tribulation period in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19, the 70th week of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, and the day of vengeance in Jeremiah 46.10. It's referred to in other ways all throughout the scriptures. Uh, we don't have time to get in into all of those. I just brought out a few of them. It will be an unbelievably terrible time. It will be the most concentrated time of pain, suffering, and difficulty that this world has ever or will ever see. Some of you here have been through some great pain and great difficulty. Well, you haven't been through this. <laughs> and if you know Jesus, you won't be. That's the good news. But it's going to be unbelievably bad. It will be a time of war, a time of disease, a time of famine, a time of mass death for the godless. 
it will be a sign that the greatest event in the history of the world is near. And that event is the second coming of Christ. Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah, in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, he describes it like this. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and it hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, and a day of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So it's a very difficult time. This day, this day of the Lord now, this period of time, it begins after the rapture of the church. Again, we talked about that. That's important. That's why we have hope. We have hope in Jesus. All these things you see going on today, you know, you know something's going on out there. Even the unbeliever, they know something's going on. Things are not like they used to be. You know, the weather, a lot of strange things happening in the weather. Get on the internet and look up how many earthquakes are taking place every day in the earth. You will not, you won't believe it. You see these things, you go, hmm, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Animals, crazy things happening with animals. It talks about that in the book of Daniel. In the end times, the, the beasts of the earth will uh, become more numerous and so forth. And, and in a sense, more dangerous. And we're, we're seeing that take place. There are more animal encounters. I, I just read last week about uh, um, how coyotes in specific areas are becoming much, much more aggressive and becoming actually a threat. They're attacking people. That never used to happen. You don't have to worry about a coyote. You know, Things are changing today. And, and th these things are going on. And so there are these signs. This day, it begins with the rapture of the church, when the, the, we talked about that last week, the Lord will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and, and he'll take the, boom, the church will be gone. And then that day, shortly thereafter, will begin. It continues the day of the Lord through the seven years of the great tribulation, and it ends after the second coming of Christ, which is Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 21. Now, Paul was only in Thessalonica three weeks, and yet he taught the church about this. This church understood this. He was there for three Sundays, and this is one of the things that he wanted to make sure they knew. How many of you have been, you know, don't answer. How many of you have never heard this, you know? How many of you have never heard this taught in church? And, and I don't want to know. And some of you might say, I grew up in a church that taught it, you know, and that's good. But a lot of you may say, we know they never talked about this kind of stuff in the church that I grew up in. Well, that's 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 not good. Paul was only there three weeks, and he so taught them about this day of the Lord, that he didn't even need to feel the need to write to them in verse 1 about the times and the seasons. Now, the, the times and the seasons, that means the chronology or the order and the characteristics of those days. He didn't, need to, he didn't feel that he needed to go back and talk to them about the order or the characteristics of those days. He was confident that they understood that. Now, Jesus said, No man can know the day nor the hour of his coming. That's Matthew 25, 13. But that doesn't mean you can't know the times and the seasons. The Thessalonians knew these things. They understood them. Paul said they knew perfectly that the day of the Lord, in verse 2, would come as a thief in the night. They knew it. They knew that perfectly. How did they know it perfectly? Because Paul had taught them, and they understood it. Too bad the modern church has gotten away from teaching prophecy, isn't it? 
the modern church has gotten away from teaching prophecy, and they've gotten away from teaching the end time. Several years ago, one of the pastors of a mega church on the in the in the northwest came out and said, we, "There's no need to teach prophecy. You can't understand it anyway." You know. Well, Paul didn't feel that way, and we shouldn't feel that way. I sure don't feel that way. We need to understand these things because they're important and they have a great effect on us. When Amy and I were first married, we weren't serving the Lord. I'm not proud of that, but it's true. I was backslidden, and she wasn't even saved. She thought she was because she went to a church that said, go through this class and you're saved. And she went through the class but she wasn't saved. She didn't know the Lord. But So we didn't start out real well, but we were going to church. At least we were doing that. And we did have a reverence for God. You know, We had a concern there, and I'm thankful for that. And one, uh, there, one night at the church we were going to, and I've told you the story before. I had Baxter Black tickets. You know who Baxter Black is? <laughs> He's a cowboy, veterinarian, poet. I love Baxter Black, man. And I had been given tickets on this Wednesday night to go up to Nichols uh, Bull Stud Place and see Baxter Black. And I was so excited, you know. Amy and I were going to go up there. And we're sitting in church Sunday morning, and they said, we are going to show a movie on the book of Revelation on Sunday night. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. The book of Revelation. That's about the great tribulation. And I, I couldn't get away from that all week. I couldn't quit thinking about that movie. It was just heavy on my heart. The end times and heavy on my mind. I came home and said, Amy, um, I, we're going to, we're going to church Wednesday. She said, what? I said, we gave the tickets away. We're going to go to church Wednesday. So we went to church Wednesday. And we, 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 I said, let's take your mom. She said, I don't think she'll go. We said, well, you never know. Let's invite her. So we invited her. And lo and behold, guess what? She came. Imagine that. You'd invite someone to church, and they came. And so we went, and we sat there, and we watched this movie about the book of Revelations. And I'll tell you this, that was the last day of backsliding in my life. It had a tremendous effect on me. And shortly thereafter, Amy got saved. Amy's mom got saved. And Amy's three younger sisters got saved. The Thessalonians knew perfectly the day of the Lord. That means accurately. They, they didn't know everything, but they were accurate in their understanding that this day would come as a thief in the night. There are things about the end times that we do not know, but there are many things that we can know. And that language in the Greek said that the Thessalonians knew those things that they could know, and they knew them down to the last detail. And so I think that helps us understand why Paul found it so important to teach the last days in the three weeks that he had. In verse 3, he says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. So the day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> and it's coming like a thief in the night. Now you think about that. It, it, not that Jesus is a thief. That's not what he's saying. It's a simile. This is, it's going to come like that, though. How does a thief come? Well, a thief comes suddenly. Now, it might not be suddenly to him because he knows he knows when he's coming, but it's suddenly to the one that he's coming to because they don't know he's coming. They don't know when he's coming. So he comes suddenly at a time that is not beforehand known. So it will be with the coming 
of the day of the Lord. It's coming. And when it comes, it will begin suddenly and quietly. And the people that are here on the earth at that time will not be expecting it. They will be saying peace and safety. The unsaved world will be enjoying a false time of peace and safety. They might even believe that America was made great again. They might buy into that and yet not know what is about to befall them. In Luke chapter 17, and and also in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said that this day, when it comes, it will come at a time that were like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot. The coming of the Son of Man, he said it will be like the days of Noah. And it will be like the days of Lot. In the days of Lot, in Luke 17, it says they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. They were doing all these things. It wasn't a cataclysmic disaster. Life was going on as usual. The other things that we know about the days of Lot, there was a disregard for God's covenant of marriage. Sexual immorality was out of control. People were seeking only to satisfy themselves, and they were willing to use anyone to help them do it. There was a population explosion. There was an increase in corruption and violence and a general rejection to the call to repentance. The days of Noah were very similar. Matthew 24 says they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Business as usual. Life was going on. Now, it's not suggesting that those things are wrong, but rather people were living for those things. They were living for the things of the world and not the Lord. Did you know that for a hundred years Noah was building that ark? A hundred years. Every day he was out there building it. People are driving by, going to work, drinking their coffee, looking over there, you know. And every day that he was out there building that ark, he was preaching a sermon. It had never rained prior to that time. This guy's building a boat in the desert. What is going on? You see, it was designed to make them think, to convict them. What's taking place here? But no one paid any attention. They never considered that judgment was coming. They just continued to live their lives. It says in Matthew 24, verse 38, Until the day. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Genesis 7, 16 says, When Noah went in, the Lord shut the door. And Matthew says, They knew it not until the flood came. You know what happened when God shut the door? Something happened that had never before happened. It started to rain. It had never rained on the earth up until that point. There was a mist that came up from the ground and watered the earth. But on this day, it started to rain. And they were all taken away. Everyone that wasn't in that ark. Matthew 24, Jesus said, So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two windmen grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not at what hour your Lord does come. Why? Because you do not want to be left behind. Verse 4, But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. The Thessalonians knew the Lord was coming. They didn't know the exact day, but they knew he was coming back for the church. Because no one knows the hour of the day when Jesus will return. And because of that, it will be somewhat of a surprise to everyone on earth But as Christians, we know, we are to know, we should know, 
the times and the seasons. And so when Jesus does come back in the rapture, while it may be initially a surprise, you know, you ever hear a loud noise and you're like, yeah, is that the Lord? You know, that's going to happen for real one day. And even to those that are looking, there will be an, an initial surprise when that trumpet sounds, but we will not be in darkness. We will know what's taking place and we will be ready. The question becomes, are you ready? Not are you a good person. Not are you trying to do things. But are you ready to meet the Lord? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Not did you take a class. Have you been born again? Have you had that personal time where you came to him and repented of your sin and asked him to forgive you and come into your heart and, and live inside you and you gave your life to him? Have you done that? If you have, you're ready. If you're not, you're, you're not ready. And that day is going to come upon you like a thief. And you're not going to go. Are you living for him? Those of you that know him. I think there's more to being ready than just being born again. Those of you that are born again, that's, that's being ready. But then are you living for him? Are you looking for him to return? Are you living literally every moment of every day in anticipation of that coming? That should be in our hearts. Not that we don't go to work or, you know, we don't prepare for the future or not that we don't use our brains, but in all that we do, we're, we're to have this in our mind. Man, Jesus could come at any moment. Jesus could come before I get done preaching. And I know I preach so long. Some of you are convinced that he will. That's why I preach so long, you know, to help you remember, oh, the Lord could come, you know, at any moment here. Are you ready to meet the Lord? If you're not, I strongly encourage you to get ready. Turn real quickly to Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Matthew 24, the disciples came to Jesus. They said, what's it going to be like at the, the last days and the signs of your coming? And he goes through a discourse there. We're not going to go through that today. But then in 25, he begins to give these parables that help them understand what it's going to be like. He said, then, as speaking of the day of the Lord, shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. Oil in the New Testament is a picture of the Holy Spirit. You see, these, these, these unwise virgins, they're religious. They got, they got their lamps. They might have their Bibles. They might go to church, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Spirit of Christ. They're not born again. They're not saved. They've not been regenerated. They might be good people, but they don't know the Lord. So they took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, now, now, now you say, wait a minute, we're not, we're supposed to be awake. You know, well, being awake doesn't mean that you don't live your life. It means you live your life in a ready manner. And five of them were ready. They had their oil. And so that they slumbered and slept, that wasn't wrong. But at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. See, you can't go on somebody else's faith. It's got to be your own. 
They said, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You got to get it for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And this is interesting. The door was shut. And afterward also came the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Man. It, what, what do you say? What, what? That's finality. They have no chance for the rest of eternity. They missed it. Jesus said, watch therefore, for ye know not the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, and you can just listen, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So being ready doesn't mean that you're doing right things for God. It's good to do right things for God, but that doesn't make you ready. The only thing that makes you ready is that you yourself personally know Jesus Christ. And you know that you know Him. And you can know that you know Him. And you should know that you know Him. And please, if you don't know that you know Him, don't be embarrassed. None of us knew Him until we were introduced to Him and accepted Him. Don't leave this church today without making a profession to, to come to know Jesus Christ personally because he's coming he's coming like a thief in the night and it's going to be when you don't think you don't think he's coming today do you better be careful because those that's the type of day when he's going to come he's going to come like a thief He's not going to give you a warning. He's not going to call you up and say, hey, I'll be there tomorrow at 6.30. You know, you better get your life right. You better quit doing that stuff you're doing, you know. He's just going to come. And you don't know when He's coming, but you can be ready for Him to come. And today is a day. Today can be the day of salvation for you so that you know that you know that you know that you're ready. Not just because I said it, but because we can show it to you in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will bear witness to you that you're saved. Verse 5. Ye are children of the light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. One of the marks of Paul's ministry when he was called by Jesus to the ministry, you can read it in Acts 26, 18. One of the things the Lord told him that he would do was to turn people from darkness to light. Darkness is the absence of light. You can look it up. The definition of darkness is the absence of light. This church was not in darkness. Because Paul had given them the light of God's Word. The light is the truth. The truth of the Word of God. The truth of Jesus Christ. Paul is essentially saying to them, you have the truth. I gave it to you. You know it. And because of that, he says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Now, that doesn't mean we can't go home at night and sleep. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that we are not to be living like the rest of the world is living. We're not to be living for self and living for the things of self. How easy it is to fall into that trap, isn't it? Even as a Christian. That's darkness. That's not light. 
That's not what we were called to. To be, we're to be, we're, how easy it is to find yourself living, not even giving consideration to the Lord. You just live in your life, doing what you feel like, doing what feels good, doing what you want, and not considering God. Paul says, don't do that. You're children of the light. And therefore, let us be living for the Lord. He's saying, fight the good fight. You know, when you go out of here, I always try to greet you. And I try to not say, hey, how are you? Because I know sometimes that will set you up to lie. You'll say, oh, I'm good, you know. And I, you ain't good, you know. So I try not to say that. And, and I try to say other things like, good to see you. And I mean that. It is good to see you, every one of you. I'm glad you came that we can be together because we can comfort one another. Amen? We need that because the day is approaching. We are not, uh, well, I got to go ahead. But here, here's what I do. Sometimes you say to me, because you want me to sin, I guess, you say, how are you? And, and I don't want to lie. So I say, I'm fighting the good fight. And now some of you, you say that to me. I'm fighting the, for fighting the good fight. I'm trying to live the way the Lord wants me to live. I'm fighting against myself. I don't want to fight against you. I want you to fight against me. But I got to fight against myself. I got to put myself to death every day, every hour of every day. I just do. That's just me. I don't know about you. Every minute of every hour of every day, every second of every minute of every hour of every day. And that's what Paul's saying. Live for the Lord. Fight the good fight. He's not saying be perfect. He's saying, but live like who you are. You're children of the light. You're children of the truth. Learn these things. You know, you can learn the truth to the point that it changes you. You realize that? The truth can overcome your strong desire to live like darkness. That's why it's important to be in the Word. I've been really considering this. i got a dog at home that doesn't do what I want. And, and I've been analyzing this dog and trying to put a lid on my anger. And, and I, I'm realizing, I'm thinking I'm learning a lot from this stupid dog, you know, about myself. And I think, why does this dog do that? Well, because it has learned that it likes that. Well, how am I going to get that dog not to do that? How do I do that? I mean, you could beat this dog to a pulp, and this dog is a timid dog. It is not going to work. Well, what can I do? I have to teach this dog. And I thought about that. Wait a minute. You mean... This dog can learn not to do what it feels like it wants to do? I guess it can. How do you do that? Well, I use cheese. <laughs> this dog, for some reason, it will do anything for cheese. And, and then I realized, well, the, the key to learning, and, and this it has to be true, that there is something better than just doing what you want to do. You, that has to be there or you will never learn this. And see, that's what Paul is trying to teach. There's something better here than living like the world and just doing what feels good. Because it does feel good. The Bible doesn't hide that. Sin is fun for a season, and then it binds you and destroys you and kills you. Paul's saying there's something better. And you and I can learn this. Because I have to believe, I mean, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, I'll admit that. But I think I'm as smart as that dog. And that dog can learn some things. And so there's hope for me. If there's hope for me, there's hope for you. Fight the good fight. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't get discouraged. We'll talk about that. It has to be daily. We're to take up our cross and put ourselves to death daily. We're not to allow ourselves to become comfortable in any sin. Is there any sin in your life that you've just become comfortable with? doesn't even convict you. Oh, I know I shouldn't, but don't let that happen. Fight against that. Paul said, let us watch. 
Let us watch. That means be alert to our manner of living. Be alert to your manner of living. Continually arousing ourselves to the dangers and pitfalls of this life because we have a constant awareness that Jesus could return at any moment. Is there ever a time in your life when you're living closer to the Lord than you are now? Watch for those things. And be sober. That word sober means unmixed with wine. And so there is that. But the idea is living without intoxicants. Living without physical and spiritual intoxicants. Charles Spurgeon said it means to keep ourselves from the fascinations, from the fascinations of this world which make men's minds drunk. That's a fight. To be in this world, but not to be of this world. And then he says this, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet for the hope of salvation. A breastplate and a helmet? What are those? Those are elements of armor. Who wears armor? The, you know, no, I was going to give it, you know. You know who wears armor. Soldiers wear armor. So that he's saying the believer is not only to watch and be sober, we're not only to be ready, but we're to be prepared for battle. We're to be equipped for war. We are to be armed for war. No soldier in Paul's day would go into combat without a breastplate. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat in those days. It wasn't drone warfare. They went at it with each other. And they wouldn't go without a breastplate. No Christian is equipped to live for the Lord a Christian life without this breastplate, without faith and love. you got to have that. They are uh, br the breastplate. And think about the breastplate. What's it do? It protects the heart. You see, your only hope of surviving this spiritual battle with your heart intact is to cover it with faith. That's the shield of God's Word. It protects your heart from the fiery darts of the devil, the thoughts which he, with which he seeks to defeat us. Without this breastplate, we would surely be defeated. We get so discouraged, we quit serving the Lord. And it's a breastplate not only of faith, but also of love. And that's the word agape. And you know we've been studying that. That's the selfless love, selfless love. Not I love myself or I love you because you love me. It's I love you just because. I love you because God said to. And I didn't muster that. God put that in my heart. It has to be produced in us. Now, this is interesting. Unlike faith, which protects the heart, love protects us from our heart. Our heart is desperately wicked. That's what it says in Jeremiah 29. In Matthew 15, 18 and following, Jesus said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth, <laughs> out of the mouth, they come forth from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, Murderer, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Love, others-centeredness protects us from those things getting out of our heart. Love God, love other people, and God can help that you not live a defiled life. We have to put these things on. And then he said, let us put on for a helmet the hope of salvation. Now, a helmet's the piece of equipment that protects our minds. Perhaps the most important part to be protected. And this is why. A Christian who has lost his hope of salvation will fall prey to the devil. You ever know a Christian that wasn't sure he was saved? <laughs> I know people, I talk to people like that all the time. You see, they don't have the helmet on. If you don't have that helmet on, the devil is going to beat you up. By putting this helmet on, 
No matter what you face, you will have hope. And this you need to understand. Satan's going to come against you. He already is. He comes against you with his lies. Things like this. You've been going to church for 10 years and you're no better now than when you began. You've been reading the Bible for five years and you're the same person now that you were when you started. Nothing's changed. You've been putting out a lot of effort, but you don't seem to be getting anything in return. You're trying to do what's right, but it doesn't seem to be having any effect on your kids. Why would you even think you're a Christian? Are you even saved? You sure don't act like it. Ever have those thoughts? That's why Paul wrote what he did. It's for that reason that it's imperative for every Christian to have and wear this piece of armor, our helmet, the hope of our salvation. Not that we hope we're saved, but it's the confidence that we are saved. That when your life is over, you'll go to heaven with the Lord forever. Not because you were a good person, not because, but because you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And when you die, He will be there with you when you die, Jesus as a Christian will be there with you and God will accept His sacrifice as payment for the debt you owe. Whether you feel like it or not. Every Christian needs this helmet. They need to know that they're saved. And we can know. We can have this hope. That word hope means confidence. It means absolute certainty. It's not a feeling. It's something that we stand on because of what God's Word says. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For you are saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of works. It's the gift of God and not of works. Lest any man should boast. You're saved by faith. You can't earn it. You just receive it. And once you receive it, you have it. And you need to have that helmet on. You need to leave here today knowing that you're saved. And not letting Satan tell you any differently. We're going to finish here with the next three verses. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, and He brings us back to where He ended chapter 4, comfort not one another, but yourselves. Comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as ye also do. So, there, the day of the Lord is coming. That's evident. A day when God is going to pour out His wrath upon this world. It will be poured out upon those that have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those that didn't listen and weren't ready. God loves everyone. Absolutely everyone. But make no mistake, He is just. And judgment is coming. We have the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah witnessing these truths to us. Now God, in His love, made a way of escape through Jesus Christ. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He got on the ark. He didn't perish in the flood. Lot was led out of Sodom by the angel. That angel was Jesus Christ, it would sure seem. And, and oh, and, and the angels told Lot, I can't do anything until you're gone. See, it's a picture of the rapture. The day of the Lord can't come until the church is gone. Now, in this, we see that God has appointed, has not appointed the church to his day of wrath. That's not what you're appointed to. God is not mad at you. God loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you so that you can live for Him. So that you can be equipped to tell others and help other people live for Him so that as many people as possible can meet Him in the air and be with Him forever in heaven. He's not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's up to you what you get. I want to obtain salvation. 
Don't you? I do not want the wrath of Jesus Christ. So that whether we live or die, even if we die physically, we shall be ever with him in heaven. He says, wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify yourselves one to the other with the understanding that Jesus is coming back for those that are his. I'm going to close with the scripture. Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my, house, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. Thomas said to, un, to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen? Amen. Oh, I went long. I knew I would. There's a lot we needed to get so we can understand the day of the Lord perfectly. Amen? So that it comes like a thief in the night. If you are completely confused, uh, sorry. Uh, just keep reading your Bible. Keep studying. Keep asking the Spirit to guide you in the truth. And if, if you want to visit with me about these things, I'd be glad, not necessarily today, but sometime in the future, I'd spend all the time that we need to help clear up any confusion that I've caused you. Before we do, and we've gone long, I know, but that's why, uh, so we can know these things perfectly, because we want to be ready, amen? But now it's first day of the month, and we're going to celebrate communion. And so if uh, Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 11, about the taking of communion, he said that we should first examine ourselves. So it's a good thing to examine yourself this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't know Jesus Christ, when Chris is going to come right now and he's going to play some music, and when the brothers are passing out the elements, come forward. You can come down here and I'll pray for you to receive Jesus. Don't be ashamed of that. We, we don't want you to have to do it when nobody's looking. We want you not to be ashamed to come to Christ. Don't be ashamed if you're old and you haven't come to Christ yet. Be more concerned about being ready. No one will think, any. There'll be everyone will rejoice if you don't know the Lord. Maybe you didn't know you needed to do that. And today you heard it and you you know what you need to do. And so you want to come forward and accept Jesus. And you can do that today. But if you don't know the Lord, Paul really said you shouldn't take communion. Because you're not going to, this is real, and you're not going to know who you're communing with. Now, we don't have a class that you have to take before you take communion. We don't stand at the door and tell you that you can or can't take communion. This is what we say. You need to be in Christ. If you're in Christ, take communion. Because it's a wonderful thing to do. But you need to, for those of you that are in Christ now, we need to examine ourselves. Are we living for God? Or are we living for self? Is there sin in our lives? Is there things that we need to take before? Is there unrepentant sin? Do we need to get that? Do we need to get cleaned up before Jesus? And there could be that. Is there someone in the body that you're at odds with that you need to make peace with? And, you know, that can happen. And you, you just, you feel the Lord leading you. It's time to, to bury the hatchet and, and forgive and, and so forth. And you can do that. You can take the time right now. Nobody, nobody should think ill of anybody for anything that they seek to do to get right with God here this morning in any way. We should just be humbled. And humility has two components. And you know what those are. Honesty and a good memory. <laughs> That'll make you humble because you know yourself. And so you don't think bad of anybody else. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, please 
It doesn't take me, but I'll help you pray the prayer. And you can know that you're ready to meet the Lord today. And we'll rejoice. We'll all rejoice. When I was a young person, I got up and went forward. I was sitting in church one morning after Amy and I were married at the end of the service. I'm telling you, I couldn't believe it because she's a shy person. She got up, she walked right down that aisle and went to the front of the church. I could not. I couldn't believe it. And she prayed to receive Jesus. And then sometime later, one morning, my mother-in-law and three young daughters get up. They walked right down the aisle of that church. And, and the man in front of me, when they were walking down, I'll never forget this, pretty loud, he said, praise the Lord. It's just so wonderful to see someone come to Christ. It shouldn't be something that you're embarrassed of. You should be glad to do it. So uh, now, because I don't want to talk anymore, and the kids should know this if you're going to let them take communion, keep in mind this is not just a ritual that adds 15 more minutes on to the end of the service that we don't really have. I'm taking your time now. Once a month. It's not that. There's a reality to this. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's time now for you to focus, those of you that are in Christ, to focus on not what you can do for Jesus, not now, not right now, but on what he has done for you. Focus on that. Ask him to help you understand it more because it'll change your life when you really understand what Jesus did. Not just the price that he paid, but the gift that he gave. It will, it will cause you to worship like you have never before worshiped. So ask him to reveal that to you. I always do. I still don't think I have the fullness of the understanding. But I'll tell you this, he gave us two components to help us do it. The first is the bread. That's a picture of his body that was broken. And he said in John 6, I'm the bread of life. And, and, and he, we know he's the word of God. That bread represents the word of God. And when you break that, it makes you strong. It changes you. He gave that to you. It's a gift that he gives to help you know perfectly how you should live and what he wants from you and what he doesn't want from you. It protects you from the discouraging thoughts of the devil. It helps you live this life with hope. The word of God. The word of God. Thank him for that. Don't forget that he gave that to you. Receive it. Open your hearts to it. Secondly, the, the juice. We take juice. We don't do wine because he said, what did he say? Be sober. We don't want to, you know, what happened? Well, boy, they had communion that Sunday, you know. You can tell it when they're going. To, no, not really. But it, I'm just teasing. I shouldn't have said that. But the, what's it represent? That's the important thing. Represents the blood. What did the blood do? It cleanses you. Isn't that interesting? The blood cleanses you. Though you were, your sin was like crimson. That's as red as it can be. The blood washes it as white as snow. Completely cleansed. God gave that opportunity to you through Jesus Christ to walk out of here, even though you're guilty, to be completely cleansed because Christ paid the price. You shouldn't be condemned. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you and to deliver you and set you free. Remember this. Remember what he did before you this morning. Amen. Brothers, let's go ahead and have the kids come. Chris, play. If you want to come forward, sometimes, go ahead, Chris. Sometimes people just want to come up and, and you can come and kneel down or sit in front if you want. If you want to just get out of your rut and say, I just... I want to get right with you again, God, or I want to get closer to you, or I just feel led to, to take that step of faith. Feel free to do that. You don't have to do that. You can do it in your seat. If you've never been saved, come down this morning and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The 
Lord's coming. You need to know that you know that you're ready. If you think you're ready, but you don't know, you need to come. You need to make sure so you can have that assurance. We fall down, we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy. Cry, holy, holy, holy is the land. Ask this morning that as we prepare to take communion, that you'd open our hearts and you'd teach us even now, your spirit would come and in a more powerful way, a more personal, individual way to each of us. And you would you'd be very present and you would help us and teach us to commune with you in the way that you desired that we would as we remember you together this morning. Forgive us for our sins. Wash away our defilements and our filthiness, and our wrong attitudes, and our rebellion, and stiff-neckedness, and our hatred, and anger, and slander, and such things. And strengthen us, Lord, through your word. Help us to break the bread of your truth and to grow in Christ. Let the word of God work effectually in each of us this morning. Randy, would you pray for the bread? Thank you, Lord, for allowing your body to be broken for us. And, and Lord, just as you break us, Lord, just bless us through your word. And Lord, just pray that you'd bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. The last night that Jesus was with the disciples, after they'd eaten supper, he got up and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take ye, 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Mark, would you pray for the cup? <clears throat> Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for your blood that was shed for us. And as we remember that today, I pray you bless this cup. In Jesus' name. After the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament. Not the right half of the Bible, but the New Covenant. It's even in Jeremiah 31. He said, where I will remember their sins no more. Isaiah speaks of it as well, being washed as white as snow. That's the new covenant in his blood. And that's what he offers us this morning through Jesus Christ. And he said, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Then Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Jesus is coming. Amen. <clears throat> you know how. You know perfectly. You know the times and the seasons. You know it's going to be like a thief in the night, but you know that you can be ready. And I trust that each of you this morning is wise enough to, to leave here ready and to know that you're ready. And so watch, watch as you go and be ready for you know not at what hour the Lord doth come. Amen? Amen. Have a good week.